Okay, so what's the deal with imaginary numbers? So we have this little symbol, I, which we used to represent the imaginary unit. It's kind of like the number one, but it's not on the number line. It's a different sort of a thing. It's actually equal to the square root of negative one. Of course, we can't take the square root of negative numbers because a negative times a negative is positive. But forget the whole square root thing, because if you think about, for example, the square root of one, it's just one. So this is just to help us understand that this is a totally different kind of number from another place. So let's take a look at the number line. So here we have the number line with zero in the middle, positive numbers going this way, one, two, three, four, negative numbers going this way, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. And so the one thing that, that everybody has in common is zero. It's kind of like the center of the universe. So what we, what we learn about is kind of, when we first learn about negative numbers, we teach kids that they're the opposite of the positive numbers, you know? So, you know, a, three, a positive three is like, you, maybe you make $3 and a, a negative three is like you spend $3 or lose $3. And so to get from the positive numbers to the negative numbers, you know, we can, we can subtract um, or add, depending on which way we want to go. But also multiplication um, takes us there. So for example, if we take the number three and we multiply it by negative one, then something interesting happens. The answer is negative three. It's almost like we end up over here, but here's the deal, and this is so philosophical. <laughs> it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. So how do we get from here to here? That's the really important thing. You know, we just kind of imagine, well, you know, maybe we just hop over there or teleport over there, or maybe this thing is like some kind of big mirror and, you know, it like flips over, you know, you know, is it like some kind of mirror image? How do we get there? Well, it turns out that multiplying by negative one is a rotation of 180 degrees. So, like if this was the center of a circle, we rotate by 180 and we end up over here. And of course, if you multiply by negative one again, guess what happens? Back to positive three. So that's another rotation of 180 degrees. Now, what's the deal and why is this important? It's just a different way of thinking about getting from positive to negative numbers or more precisely, a different way of thinking about what does it mean to multiply by negative one? Well, here's the deal. What about I? What about I? What about I? Stop. Okay, so what happens if you multiply the square root of negative one times the square root of negative one? That's I times I, or, uh, or I squared. So, so what is it, right? Well, think about this. If we multiply the square root of nine times the square root of nine, we get nine. And why is that? Well, that's because the square root of nine is three, and the square root of nine is three, and three times three is nine. So we can see that if we multiply a, a root um, by itself, we get the number that's inside the root. So if we multiply the square root of negative one times itself, then we should get what's inside, which is negative one. So wait up. An imaginary number uh, times another imaginary number, in this case, equals a real number. One, a regular, oh no, negative one. A regular number though, it's on the number line right here. So let's talk about that, how do we get there? So it turns out that multiplying by the imaginary unit is also a rotation, but it's not this kind of rotation. It's something totally different. So let's take um, the, the number three, uh, let's use two, because I, I don't want to mess up my little chart. Let's take the number two and multiply it by i. What do we get? Uh -huh. Algebra tells us we get 2i. That's not very useful. And your algebra teacher will tell you that this is an imaginary number. It's not on the real number line. See, these are the real numbers. Where is this? But more interestingly, if we multiply this by i again, we get 2i squared, which is two times negative one. And suddenly we're back on the real number line, but we're over here. So what does it mean to multiply by i? It's a rotation, but not as we know it. It's a rotation 
by 90 degrees. It takes us off of the number line, out here into imaginary space. And then we multiply by I again, and that's another rotation by 90 degrees. So this is multiplied by I, this is multiplied by I, and of course, what would happen if we multiply by I again? So here we had two I, okay? And then when we multiply by I, we get two I squared, which is negative two. And if we multiply by I again, we get negative two I. Here we are, negative two I, another rotation of 90 degrees. And if we multiply by I again, we get negative two I squared. And of course, I squared is negative one. So that's negative two times negative one, which is positive two. And we are right back here to the real positive. It's, it's a thing of beauty. <laughs> so that's what it is. It's a rotation by 90 degrees, which actually takes you off of the number line. And we have something else out here. It's another axis called the imaginary axis. These are imaginary numbers. There's not really a symbol for that. We use it something like that. These are the positive imaginary numbers, like positive 2i, and down here are the negative imaginary numbers, like negative 2i. Okay, so yeah, we got to talk about this. What does this mean kind of like physically or like even philosophically or metaphysically? Like, like what does it mean to rotate out of something? Because when we talk about the real number line, I mean, that's, that's just a real thing. Everybody can count these numbers. But we're out here in some other place. So what does that kind of represent? Well, I imaginary numbers represent um, moving out of your domain, whatever that domain is. So if you're dealing with the number line, it means moving off of the number line. If you're dealing with a plane, like a, 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 a coordinate plane in Euclidean space, 2D, like this sheet of paper, then, then using imaginary numbers would actually represent moving off of the paper. And if you're talking about three-dimensional space like this room or, or the space between my hands, uh, an imaginary axis would represent moving out of that space entirely. So we're actually talking about like a higher dimension in all cases. So there's something interesting too here um, about rotations. How is it that we can have a rotation and, um, and yet go somewhere else and it not be real or not be something we can see? But yet we know it, it's real. So this kind of touches on this question is, are there things that we can see or things that we can't see but are still real even though we can't see them? Well, obviously, if we moved something into another dimension or this paper was your universe and I put my hand up above it, it's outside of your universe. It's real, but it's just not something you can see. So first of all, um, yeah, take a look at this. If we take this point right here, let's start with one this time, and we move it around in a circle. If you look at just the horizontal motion of this point, it actually starts at negative one, right? And then as it moves up here, the numbers get smaller and smaller. We're only looking at kind of the horizontal movement, side to side only. So the point moves around, moves around, moves around, and it moves basically all the way from positive one through zero, and then to negative one. And then, of course, if we keep rotating, it starts making its way back through zero and to positive one. So only considering the side to side motion, negative, positive, negative, positive, we can go around and around forever and ever and ever. And it turns out in trigonometry, there's a function that does that. It's called um, cosine. And uh, it looks like this. So this is zero degrees, and uh, this is one, and this is negative one, and this is zero. So cosine starts up here and looks something like this. Actually, it goes all the way down to negative one. Sorry, I didn't draw that down far enough. Looks like that. And this actually just represents the horizontal motion of a point that moves around a circle, okay? So it starts at one, at zero degrees. By the time we get to 90, it's neither left nor right, so it's right here at this 90 degrees. When we go over here to 180, it's all the way down to negative one, so that's 180. And then right here is 270, we're at zero again. And when we get back to the top, we're all the way back to positive one. That's a full 360 degrees rotation around the circle. So that's what this is. This is the side to side motion of a point moving around a circle. 
okay? And if you go around the circle, it just goes on forever and ever. And it can go this way too. So anyway, but you see this and you're like, oh, that's not a circle, that's just a wave. It's like a wave on water or somebody, you know, whatever. Well, I'm gonna show you something. So here's a wave, right? You can see that perfectly clearly. See how that wave, it just goes up and down, up and down, up and down, right? But what if I told you that that is not just a flat wave moving up and down? You just can't see the whole picture because of your perspective. So it turns out that it is, mo it is moving up and down, right? Or, or for example, cosine, it's moving side to side. Maybe that's a better illustration. Right? We're moving, zigging side to side, side to side, side to side. But from another perspective, something else is happening. We're actually not just moving side to side, we're also moving front to back, see? And what you're looking at is not really just an up and down wave. It's actually part of a, a long set of circles stretched out, which we call a spiral or a spring. I don't know, something like that. So that is really... You know, from one perspective, from a two-dimensional perspective, it looks just like an up and down wave or a side to side wave. But there's something more to the picture that we can't see. But from the right perspective, from a three-dimensional perspective, you can see that. It's actually part of a circle. So it's the same thing here. In this one-dimensional number line, we can see the side to side motion as we multiply by numbers, um, fractions of I, if you will, um, but there's another component that's sort of like the, it's like the spring going front to back that we can't really see. And that's as the point travels out into imaginary space and comes back to the real number line, travels out again. So there's all sorts of applications for this in video processing, audio processing, engineering, signal analysis, quantum physics. I mean, it's crazy. So the, the, the imaginary unit is really important. It gives us a tool for working with things that actually sort of move out of our domain and back in. It gives us a tool for understanding that things are happening, things are going on that we may not be able to see. And um, it's the saddest thing about it all is why do we call it imaginary when it's actually real? Just because you can't see it. Dad, you know that um, thing you were telling me about, that um, thing like people are in like the space station and then they'll be like studying the, um, at like not atmosphere, but like space. And then they'll see like a random like, Hydrogen atoms like floating. Yeah, and they'll be gone. exactly. So this is um, what we call like the the particle soup. It's part of um, quantum physics. At the smallest level of like subatomic particles and even whole atoms, like out in the vacuum of space where there's nothing. Um, if you have sensitive enough instruments, you can actually detect random particles like electrons or neutrons or sometimes even whole atoms like a hydrogen or a helium, just pop out of existence, like literally appear in empty space from nothing and then go away again. And this happens all the time. In a vacuum, you have particles that pop in and out of existence constantly. It's almost like space is not really a, f a flat ocean of nothing, but it, there's little tiny ripples and waves all the time. And all these little ripples and waves actually represent certain particles and they come and go. So. It's, it's actually, if you can just imagine a really tiny circle, things are moving constantly. And a lot of times it looks like it's zero. But what's really happening is it might look like zero, but it's out here in imaginary space. So I don't know what that means. What does that really mean? Our universe, if we could imagine it was a flat sheet of paper, maybe it's, it's like that flat sheet of paper, which looks flat to us, is really floating on an ocean with all sorts of waves going through it. Mm -hmm. And those random waves sort of cut through our universe and where they cut through, there's a little disturbances and those are just so particles like, that come out of nothing. But, but the cut through would be like something like that. Exactly, exactly. That's what the waves would be. Yeah, like. well, this is what we could see. These are like when the particles really exist. Oh, look, right here, there's a photon. Cool. But what happens when that particle disappears? We measure right here and there's like, no, it's gone. Is it really gone? Well, here's, I ask you, is it really gone when the wave is in the middle? Is it really gone or is it just front to back? Yeah. Mind blown. <laughs> All right. Thank you, De Kevin Patterson. <laughs>